Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I want to thank you all for being here with me today. Oh, it's a nice Wednesday. I'm having a meeting with a business mentor at um, 11, so that's always nice. I have a meeting with the alternate board on I think the first Wednesday of every month, and then on um, you know, different, different days we have a meeting with uh, the person in charge of that. And we get lots and lots of um, business advice. Why aren't you in Vegas playing the World Series of Poker? Because I want to keep my family. If you go, if you have a family with two kids and a wife, and you go to Las Vegas for three months, like I used to do during the summer, that will not work so well for you. So you have to pick and choose. And fortunately, microphone's on the wrong side. Fortunately, um, all the stuff in the World Series of Poker happening now is mostly mixed game stuff, which I don't feel inclined to play, and also a lot of smaller buy-in stuff like. $1,500 buy-in tournaments, and I don't feel inclined to play those either. So, the schedule is actually pretty nice. We're right at the beginning. They had the World Poker Tour events, which are big, and then they also had um, like a 10K and a 5K right at the beginning, and then at the end, they have a 5K starting on the 30th, which I'll play, and then um, the main event, and then there's like another 10K, and there's some other stuff towards the end, another 10K, another 5K. So, it's, it's very nice where the big stuff is at the beginning and the end. So, worked out perfectly. Thank you, World Series. Um, last night we did a webinar, three cash game lessons. There are many cash game lessons. I actually have my cash game masterclass coming out tomorrow. You can get information for that at pokercoaching.com slash premium. Actually, there may not even be any information yet. You can go there, get on the email list, and we will send it to you or send you the information as soon as it is available tomorrow. It's a 29 part class. I'm looking at the PowerPoint here. It's 189 slides long. None of them are full of fluff. It is um, very dense, and um, the goal is to teach you everything you could possibly need to know about cash games, and that's going to be part of Poker Coaching Premium, just included, along with um, 70 other 30-minute discussions on particular topics that you all asked me to discuss, also lots and lots of quizzes, and lots of webinars. We have webinars by Fader Holtz, we have webinars by Matt Affleck, Alex Fitzgerald, Evan Jarvis, myself, clearly, and... Um, Check it out. Anyway, that webinar will be available soon on YouTube. But anyway, today I want to discuss another cash game lesson, more like a, a broad idea, a, a broad topic that I think is relevant, and that is how to play against limpers. In the high stakes games, you almost never come up against limpers because people realize limping is terrible. <laughs> so if limping is terrible, don't do it. Everybody realizes it's terrible, so no one limps. Now, Whenever you are facing limpers, it's very important to ask yourself, what is the limpers range, okay? Don't just think all limpers are the same. That is a big mistake. Assuming that generic situations are always the same is a significant mistake many people make. They think, okay, there's a limper, I raise with everything in my range. But no, 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 don't do that. You need to realize that primarily there are two types of limpers. There are tricky limpers who will limp with some amount of premium hands, maybe a lot of them, or a large portion of the range is going to be aces, kings, etc. Or maybe just a tiny percentage, like say they limp, I don't know, 30% of hands, but and that is aces and kings. And then there's also straightforward limpers who limp with stuff that is not quite good enough to raise. Now I think a lot of people think that most limpers are the very straightforward ones, but most limpers, people who are still limping today, have learned to some extent that if you're going to limp, you must also trap sometimes. And if you're going to trap sometimes, you also get to bluff sometimes. Does that limp raise you with ace-five suited or 10-nine suited sometimes? But um, typically you're gonna find limpers from early positions are capable of being tricky, whereas limpers from the later positions are almost always straightforward, meaning they're limping with the junk. So we have to discuss two scenarios now, right? Facing the tricky limper and facing the straightforward limper. And this is just one. We're going to talk about multiple if we have time. So um, these people will limp with some or mostly premium hands, or perhaps only just a tiny percentage, but most will limp re-raise with their best hands. So keep that in mind, right? When, you, when they limp and you do happen to raise them, then you need to be a little bit... When, when they re-raise, you need to be very cautious. So if you think you're going to get limp re-raised, should you be raising the limper much at all? Well, the answer is clearly no, right? 
Instead, you want to limp behind with hands that flop well. And if you are going to have a bluffing range, it needs to be with hands that do not flop well. So say someone limps from early position, they may be tricky. If you have a hand like ace-10 offsuit, sure, raise it. Because if you raise ace-10 offsuit and get re-raised, you can easily fold. But if you raise with like king-queen of hearts and they re-raise you, now it's a pretty bad spot to be in because king-queen of hearts is great, but you're facing a limp re-raise and it's not a good spot anymore. So you always want to be limping behind with hands that flop well. And that's usually going to be the good, suited, connected stuff and the pairs. Um, understand that you can raise for value against these players with the intention of folding if they three bet you. It is okay. Like when you do raise ace-10 offsuit, if they limp and you raise ace-10 offsuit and they call, you probably extracted a little bit of value, right? Um, and if they re-raise you, you fold because you realize their limp re-raising range is very, very strong. In my cash game masterclass, it's part of Poker Coaching Premium. We actually go through a lot of hand examples. We're not going to go through too many hand examples here. I'm coming up with these off the top of my head. But you get the drift. Let's see. Let's see what all of you are saying in the chat. Good morning, chat. Um, just had your first experience in live games. Came in third. Good. Made 5.5 times the buy-in. Crazy rake. Yeah. So I'm saying you got bad beat. No one cares about bad beats. No bad beat stories are allowed in this venue. Sorry. Um, all right. What do you do against a straight four lumber? Well, these players are the ones you do want to be raising very often. Do I have a book that has all this information? <laughs> very conveniently, yes, I do. Not all of it, some of it. It's called Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. It's a big book. Poker's not an easy game, it's a big book. And it discusses ranges, right? How to play with and against various ranges. You can get this at what? JonathanLittlePoker.com slash mastering. So check that out. You can also get the audiobook for free if you've never signed up for Audible at JonathanLittlePoker.com slash free. I try to make all these things um, available for you or free if you try. Poker say, just signed up for a free trial of poker coaching. Good stuff. Thank you. I do my best. And um, you'll like the full version even more, I'm sure. It's a fantastic book and audiobook. Yes, I sat in a little room for about 20 hours reading this. I read the whole thing. Actually, see all those books back there? I read the vast majority of them for audiobook. It's a lot of fun. I actually don't mind it. I, got, I learned how to read out loud way better. <laughs> Can I hold up the book again? I'll hold it up all day. We'll just sit here like this. All right. Let's talk about facing one straightforward limper. So these players usually have junky hands that do a uh, junky range that does not contain their best hands, right? Because they raise their best hands and then they limp with their junk. So if they limp with their junk, well, you can raise them with a pretty wide range. Now, I don't think you need to go overboard. I think you should typically raise them with roughly the same range you would normally raise a player with. Or you normally raise from that position. So look at your normal cutoff range, let's say, if you're in the cutoff. If they limp from middle position and you know they're weak, then you should be raising with roughly your normal cutoff range. Um, maybe a little tighter, maybe a little bit looser, depending on the exact scenario, but something like that is probably fine. We have completely free range charts for some default ranges at pokercoaching.com slash charts. So go check that out if you do not already know fundamentally sound ranges. Um, again, some people you may be able to raise even wider because if they're going to limp and then they're going to fold a lot of the time, then clearly that's just great. Um, especially from late position, when they limp from late position, because that's when their ranges are going to usually be the weakest because most people know to raise their best hands, right? So if they're limping, they have like 9-8 offsuit or ace-4 offsuit. And if they limp and then you raise... And when I say raise, I mean raise to about the size of the pot, maybe five big blinds, maybe six big blinds. They're going to call or fold, either one's fine, and then they're going to check fold on a lot of flops when they miss, and you're just going to manufacture equity. So you want to be attacking the straightforward lumpers, but not the tricky lumpers. Do you have a suggested limping range, or do you even suggest creating a limp calling range in small six? No, I just raise everything. I'm, I do not have an open limping range. Understand, there's a big difference when someone limps in front of you compared to when... Um, you're the first one to limp. I'm not the first one to limp essentially ever uh, because whenever you raise preflop, you get fold equity. Fold equity is nice. Now, if you know you're going to get called every time, you probably still want to raise because you don't mind building the pot if you expect to have a little bit of an advantage or a hand that flops well. So, no, I don't have an open limping range, but I certainly will limp behind like we just discussed with hands that flop very well. 
Some people will limp depending on the table dynamics. So should you be aware of your table image? Sure. Right? I mean, look, I'm not saying you need to develop some super simple strategy, right? Poker is hard. If your opponents think you're going to raise them every single time they limp, then they may be looking to limp re raise you. So chill out a bit, right? Maybe they think you're a nit. They, you listen, you have to understand when people limp, they're essentially saying, I think my opponents are so terrible that I want to keep them in the pot. Or they're saying, I think my opponents are so passive to where I can limp and not have the repercussion of being raised, right? That's what they're saying. And that's a big problem, right? They're essentially saying that you're terrible. When people open limp, they, don't, they, they may not realize this, but they are saying that you are just awful. And so they are trying to take advantage of you being awful. So don't be awful, right? In the small blind, there's a limping range in our charts. Yes, that is the one scenario where you should have an open limping strategy. Again, there are exceptions to almost every rule in poker. Let's see. In some high stakes games, people now start limping from late position. Yeah, with 20, 30, 40 big blind stacks, that is certainly a viable strategy. That is clearly not what we're discussing here. And uh, you should have an open limping range in those scenarios. But again, that's not what we're discussing. We're discussing small stakes cash games. Jonathan, what is better? PokerCoaching.com is better, in my opinion. I made the site that I wanted when I was younger, and even today. You all have to realize, when I make all of these products, and whenever I pay significant money to get other coaches to make webinars for all of you, I'm kind of paying them significant money to make poker coaching webinars for me, and then sharing it with everyone. And what I have designed at PokerCoaching.com is what I would want. Poker Coaching Premium is essentially a gigantic database of every poker question and answer that you could ask for. That way, you can always find the answer to your questions. And that's what I want. I want to know, like say I want to know how to play against a tricky lumper. Find it, go search it, it'll come right up. And say you want to know about bankroll management or mindset or how to play against a format, whatever. All of these things will um, be available for you. There's like at your fingertips. And that's what I want. And I think that's what a lot of people want as well. That's what you all have told me you wanted, so we built it. Thoughts on limping in the tournament again. Really, you only want to be open limping with shallowish stacks from late position. From a game theory optimal point of view, should we even go here? From a game theory optimal point of view, the only time you should have a limping range is exactly on the button or the small blind. From the earlier positions, you want to raise because you really want the button to fold. Uh, let's see. And Mark says in your games, you see people open limp because it's the more fun than folding. Sure. You see guys playing King 7 offsuit under the gun. Sure, that's great. You'll absolutely crush them. What do you think about overlimping with medium pairs? Sure, you don't have to raise with medium pairs. Medium pairs do great in small pots because you either flop the nuts or you don't. All right, um, what now? So against one straightforward lumper, these are the players who have weak ranges, you should tend to raise with mostly a strong linear range which is just going to be your best hands, right? Um, it is still fine to limp behind with some hands. Again, don't think you must raise the limpers every single time. It's perfectly fine to limp hands like small pairs, weak suited aces, suited connectors, suited gappers, and even some decent offsuit connectors like 9-8 offsuit. Like say cutoff is awful and they limp and you know the blinds are rather passive, then you can limp behind with stuff like 9-8 offsuit. You don't have to raise. And then you just play a flop in position with, you know, probably about 25% equity, but you're in position. So you're going to over-realize your equity. So you don't necessarily have to raise in those spots. Um, poker Coaching is the best site that you've used. It's the best site that I've used, too. Let's see. Um, in general, most straightforward limpers are generally weak, right? They are straightforward. So if they do limp re-raise you, then they probably have a good hand, right? Is it bad to limp as the first person in? Yes, for the most part. For the most part. Not always, but for the most part. All right, now let's discuss facing multiple limpers. Okay? So, first question. Is the first limper tricky or straightforward, right? If the first limper is tricky, you need to start knitting it up a little bit because, again, you don't want to get limp re-raised. It's still fine to raise stuff like ace-10 offsuit, ace-9 offsuit, king-jack offsuit, and if you do get limp re-raise, then you fold, right? But you don't want to raise stuff like king-queen suited because if you raise king-queen suited and get re-raised, again, you have to fold, and that's not what you want. You want to see a flop. 
So do not think that just because you probably have the best hand that you need to raise, you want to see a flop with hands that flop well. And with hands that don't flop well, then, you know, go for it. Um, you may find that against multiple limpers, you're going to need to raise a little bit bigger, right? A pot size raise is usually ideal, but you may find that in your particular game, maybe if you raise like 10 big blinds, you get folds every time. Think about how strong that would be if, say, two people limp, folds to you on the button, and you have like jack three offsuit. You can make it 10 big blinds and get a fold every time. It's pretty strong because it's just completely free money. Um, I wrote about this in my book, Strategies for Beating Small Stakes Poker Cash Games, about how this was a play that just printed money when I played 1-2 for a week, and it was fantastic. You open, let, back, raise your entire range. Sure, do it. See what happens. Might be good, to be fair. Um, in general, facing multiple limpers, I tend to play a little bit tighter than I normally would, unless the limpers are especially weak. Because then, if they're especially weak, there's just more dead money in the pot, right? So, let's say we do raise over a limper, and we get limp re-raised. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's not what we're discussing. Let's say you limp behind. This is a spot that a lot of people screw up, because when they limp behind, they just fold a lot. Say someone limps, you limp with your king, queen of hearts, or eight, seven of hearts, or ace, five of hearts, whatever. Then someone gets attacked raises. First things first, what are the pot odds, right? If, you're, if it goes limp, 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 you're in there, and someone makes it 15 big blinds, you should fold almost everything, because you've you put in no money and you're getting awful pot odds, right? But if it goes limp, 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 and then someone makes it six big blinds, well, now you can call with basically everything. Um, so typically you're finding if the opponent makes it more than the size of the pot, like a lot more than the size of the pot, that's when you want to start folding a decent amount. But if your opponent raises to the pot or less, you should very often be calling with your limping range. And remember, your limping range is designed to flop well for the most part, which means you really want to see a flop. So, the hands that you are limping should be able to call very often. So what I see a lot of people doing wrong is they'll be limp, limp, limp. You'll limp behind with like a six offsuit, which is terrible. And then someone will raise, then you have to fold, clearly. But like you don't want to play a six offsuit to start with. You should just fold it preflop. Listen, it's okay if it goes limp, 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 and you're in the cutoff with a six offsuit to fold. Don't think you have to call there. Because, yeah, you may have the best hand, but um, you're going to flop so poorly. PP for life says, on the button, can you raise blind when there are three limpers, one caller, and then just see about a third pot? I mean, no. <laughs> I mean, it depends on the limpers, right? That's exactly what we're discussing here. That plays like that that are just generic plays. It goes limp, limp, I raise, and I bet. It doesn't work because you have to consider the opponent's ranges. When combating sticky limpers, you find that your main game raising the three, four, even five X doesn't fold them out because they have money in the pot. But when you raise this 6 to 10x, you get no, get no action. What should you do? Well, Tim, if that's the case, say, well, first off, you should never raise the three big blinds. When it goes limp for one and a call and a call and you raise the three, what odds are you presenting? You're presenting like 6 or 8 or 10 to 1 pot odds. So obviously they're never going to fold. They would be awful to fold. So a pot size raise versus three limpers is going to be about 7.5 big blinds, I think. Something like that. So 7.5 is about the size of the pot. And you know if they fold a lot, fine. Start bluffing them. Bye, Daddy. Oh, you're leaving? Come here. Let's tell everybody bye-bye. Ugh. I want to talk to you. You want to talk to people today? Yeah. Are you a limper or a razor? Razor. Yeah, you're a razor. That's right. Can you say hello to everyone? Hello. Are you about to go out? You're going to go to the park? Mm hmm What are you going to do? Go get all wet. You're going to get all wet at the park? Yeah. Is it going to get on your hair? Yes. And your face? Yes. Do you, like, you smell like sunscreen? You smell like sunscreen. Good. Good. Can you tell everyone good luck in your games? Good luck in your games. Can you say have a great bye. day? Bye. Give me a bye bye kiss. Oh. Oh. All right. See you. Love you. All right. Have fun. Have fun at the park. Oh, yeah. Shut the door. You gotta shut the door. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye bye. All right. Um, what were we talking about? James always distracts me. Let's see. Um, so yeah, you should make about a pot size raise. And if you do find that specific raise sizes get lots of folds, use that size as only bluffs, right? Like say you know they're going to fold to a 10 blind, big blind raise almost every time, if not every time. And if you raise to five big blinds, they're going to call every time. 
Well, then raise the five big blinds with your nut hands and ten big blinds with your junk, and then just print money because they're never going to figure it out because you just told me they fold it every time, right? So anyway, after you lent behind and um, someone raises, you always want to ask what odds am I getting, and usually you're going to be getting the right odds unless your opponent blasts it. And if they blast it, realize that you should be adjusting and starting to limp behind some hands that can easily continue. Thank you for not kissing him like Tom Brady would. My boy gives me kisses on the mouth all the time. I don't know how Tom Brady kisses. I don't follow Tom Brady. But uh, you can't help the baby if he wants to kiss you on the mouth. What are you going to do? You just saw the 2045 World Series of Poker Champ. That's probably me. You know, if you play it enough, you will inevitably win it. Actually, one time in my life, I won a tournament that had like 10,000 people in it. It was a $10 buy-in tournament on Poker Stars. This was when I was already playing like $1,000 buy-in tournaments. But they always had... I think they had like a $25 tournament and a $10 buy-in tournament every Sunday. They got infinite people. And I did I win or did I take second? Maybe I took second. I don't know. Anyway, um, that was my best run in a 10,000-person tournament. And I remember it paid like, I don't even know, like 20K or something. Like a lot. <laughs> like 2,000 buy-ins. <laughs> like, man, why didn't I win? No, maybe it wasn't 2,000. I don't know. It was a lot. Like, why did I not win, uh, win the main event? But that's okay. They grow so fast. No such thing as too much loving before they come unwilling. Yeah, he, James is in a phase now where he like, he says, give hugs, give kisses. And that's it. Are you ever going to join one of my home games again? Timing's not so good. So I don't know. What's the best way to narrow your opponent's ranges? Figure out how they play and then realize every action they take narrows their range. So, for example, let's say someone is going to play, and we know they're going to play for 30% of hands from the cutoff, okay? Let's say your opponent's bad, and they limp some of those hands. Let's say they limp the bottom 15%, 15 to 30, and they raise the top 15%. So right off the bat, if they limp, you've already narrowed their range to only 15% of hands. If they raise, you've narrowed their range to the other 15% of hands. This is why it's so bad to limp, because you narrow your range immediately. You do everything you can to keep your range muddled and clouded. And that's why it's usually ideal to use only one action preflop, which is usually just to raise. You could also split it by perhaps raising and shoving if you're shallow stacked. Um, obviously folding is the other option. But you want to keep your range as clouded as you can without sacrificing equity. Now, something that comes up a lot is with um, push fold apps or reshove apps. Um, there, there are charts out there that will tell you the right strategy if your only options are to, let's say, shove or to reshove. So let's say, for example, someone raises two big blinds on the cutoff and you're on the button with 20 big blinds. In that scenario, there are charts out there that people claim make you play better, but really they don't. And they'll tell you which hands you can shove or fold. The problem, though, is that you're supposed to be calling here a decent amount of the time. So your options are not only shove or fold, they are shove, call, or fold. And if you only shove or fold, you are playing, first off, like way fewer hands than you should be, and you're sacrificing a ton of equity. Now, compare that to another spot. Let's say everyone folds to you on the button and you have 10 big blinds. You, again, can limp, shove, or fold. But here, if you do opt to have a limping strategy, it doesn't actually gain you a whole lot of equity. So there, maybe it's fine to use only a shove or fold strategy. So you always want to make sure that you understand the implications of splitting your range in various ways. And in general, having a limping strategy in most scenarios just sacrifices equity because limping lets the blinds realize their equity. You all may not realize this, but the vast majority of your profit is going to come from winning pots uncontested. And that's it. What is my home game? JonathanLittlePoker.com slash home game has the information. We give away, I think, $200 worth of Jonathan Little credits every week. I used to play it a lot, but now... I'm telling you, with the kids, with life, life is hectic. Basically, all of my free time, all four hours of free time I had each week, three of which I would devote to the home game, are gone. <laughs> and then some. So we have no free time. We use all of it instead to make beneficial products and material to help you better your poker. So that's basically it when it comes to facing raises. You want to make sure that you are very actively thinking about the limpers' strategies, right? Do not blindly raise them. If you blindly raise them every single time, what's going to happen is people will eventually realize that. And then they're going to adjust and they're going to stop folding. Or maybe they even stop limping. 
Remember, you don't mind if people limp, right? You want them limping because they're making mistakes for the most part. And you don't want them to stop making mistakes. Like imagine someone's gonna limp like they're 20% to 40% hands every time, let's just pretend. And you raise them four times in a row, well, they may stop limping those hands and that's not good for you. So don't raise them every time. Don't kill the sheep. You wanna shear the sheep, right? We have grips. Evan Jarvis, welcome in the um, Instagram chat. Hello, hello. Evan Jarvis has great quizzes and webinars over at pokercoaching.com. Check those out and get a completely free trial and go get that content. How do you play against people like William Kasuf? I don't know how William Kasuf plays. I don't think I've ever played with him. What percentage of hands do I play? Do they play? It depends. I mean, right? This is what we're trying to discuss. That it's really difficult to say how to play against a generic player because we don't play against generic players. We play against specific players. You thought most of your profit came from River Valley. Depends on who you're against, right? But quite often, well, think about how many hands go to showdown, right? Not a lot of them. If you look at a lot of the high stakes players, they actually don't win much money at showdown. They may even break even or have like a tiny win rate at showdown, but they're one, they, they win a lot of money in pots where their opponents fold too often. In the small stakes games though, yeah, you do make more of your money from value betting. So perhaps that's not always a correct statement. How do you play against someone who talks a lot? How does their talk or talking impact anything? I think a lot of people get in their heads that they have to react when people do something to them. Like, I mean, how do you combat speech play? Just don't talk back. Who said you had to talk back to the guy? Call the floor man. Tell them that this person's berating you, right? Shut down whatever they're trying to do or just realize it's irrelevant. And if anything, they're giving you information, but you don't have to accept it. Whenever you're playing against someone who has good speech play, like um, Daniel Negrande is a good example. He'll get in there, he'll chat, he'll say things, he'll do things. And I bet he's probably pretty balanced. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But... I don't know what he's doing. I, I'm definitely not egotistical enough to think that I can pick up something from one of the best players in the world speech, right? So ignore it, right? You're allowed to not, not react to things and not even focus on things, not pay attention to things. And especially if you think you play better fundamentally sound poker than your opponent, just do that and they're gonna lose. And um, I have seen a few Will and Kasuf hands. He does some ridiculous stuff. And if you do ridiculous stuff against someone who's playing fundamentally sound, you're going to get crushed. So anyway, that's that. Don't, I mean, understand that. Say someone's trying to talk to you and trying to engage with you, and you don't have a lot of experience with that, don't go play their game. Play a different game. Similarly, say you're playing against one of the best players in the world, and you just happen to know that they love min-raising, and they love defending against min-raises, and they know exactly how to play against min-raises. Pre-flop. Well, don't min raise. Maybe you need to be making it 2.3 big blinds, maybe 2.8 big blinds. Sure, maybe you have to play a tiny bit tighter, but you may take them to part of the game tree that they are not quite as well versed in. Um, I listened to, a, to one, one of my friends, Dominic Nietzsche, the other day, discussing how he started limping from various positions with a balanced range of his, well, I presume a balanced range. I've studied a lot of his final tables. Um, a balanced range of his nut hands and then some hands on the cusp of playability. And you can't really raise them all that often because he's gonna have the nuts every once in a while and the hands that are limping don't mind limp and calling. And yes, he gives up a little bit of equity pre-flop, but he takes his opponents to part of the game tree that they are not well versed in, right? And there's merit in that, especially once everyone has studied a particular scenario, you don't want to go to that scenario because there's no edge to be had. Um, okay, so let's see. People love Evan Jarvis. Yes, short stacked in a bounty. Is our fold equity reduced by the value of the bounty? Well, yeah, clearly, if you're gonna, if people get a bounty by calling you, they should be calling you more often. The other day, I played a weird, weird tournament where it was a $400 buy in, um, but one of the players at my table had a bounty on them worth somewhere between $0 and $50,000. <laughs> Very odd, because if you want, you got some stock options on a, on a short of a stock that was currently not live, but if it went live, you'd make a ton of money. Fun spots we find ourselves in, huh? So anyway, this guy's at my table, and someone did the rough math, and the equity was probably something like $10,000 for the bounty. So we're playing every pot with that guy, and we're trying to play big pots with that guy. I did not collect the bounty, unfortunately. 
I did take third place in the tournament, though. Here, we have a little trophy, a third place trophy. Where is it? There it is. Third place trophy. 15th annual spring poker tournament. For third place, we didn't get a whole lot of money. Is that coffee in my cup? Yes, this is called a little coffee. Straight coffee. We got off coffee for a while. We fasted for a few days last week. I didn't enjoy myself. My wife asked, why am I always trying to pick a fight? <laughs> I don't do so well without sleep and food. And um, that week I didn't get either, so that was fun. Let's see. <laughs> the speech play is similar to Charlie bit my finger. How can you stop him from biting you? Well, just remove your finger from his mouth. Just ignore them and play a sound game. That is exactly right. You play in a home game with the same people each week. Image is tight aggressive. Should you create a small limp calling range to disguise your better hands? No. I can tell you, if you're playing against... like it, Most people in most home games are not world-class players who just play better than they do. You are, we are programmed to be imprinted on. We must unlearn. It's kind of true, right? I mean, you learn from other people. I mean, think about this, right? In most small-stakes cash games, you'll see people open raising to five big blinds preflop or ten big blinds preflop. And Why? You'll ask, well, that's the, that's the raise that everybody at the table makes. That's not a good reason. You have to realize that people are stuck in the small stakes. It means they're not good enough to play the high stakes. Or presumably they don't have a bankroll for the high stakes, which means they have not won enough money from the small stakes to move up. So why model your game after players who cannot win in the current stake? And the current stake is not big. Doesn't make sense, right? You want to be modeling your game after winning players, which is why at PokerCoaching.com we have great cash game players. We have great tournament players. And we are trying to, well, we are very clearly explaining to you all how to win. We've had lots of great success stories. One of my students, who started with me two years ago now, started playing 1-2, couldn't beat 1-2. Now he's beating 5-10 for $120 an hour, which is great. You know, it's like life-changing life changing scenario, right? He's put in something like 1,000 hours, and you do the math. He's doing great. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to teach people to beat the games, and you don't do that by copying bad players. Uh, let's see. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Let's see. In the casino you play, there's a large segment of players who will limp call their whole range of sixes to tens, ace, eight to ace, king, etc., etc. Well, good. Don't raise those people all that much because their ranges are strong, right? Don't raise strong ranges. Look, I think everyone, well, not everyone, some of you, seem to be thinking something to the effect of my opponents are world-class and I should be adjusting to them. But the answer to that is no, 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 no. And almost all small stakes and medium stakes and high stakes games, your opponents are not playing fundamentally sound to the point that if you just learn to play fundamentally sound, you will crush them. And that's what I teach you at pokercoaching.com. That's what I teach you in this book. I teach you how to do all of these things and then how to adjust. Uranus has it right. 99% of the people are not willing to put in the hard work. And it's true. They want to try to look for some magic bullet of, I'm going to do something tricky and trick my opponents. Why don't you just play better, right? Just learn to play better, and then you don't have to trick anyone. You can go there, implement your strategy, adjust as necessary, and go from there. DP says, all the, all the world-class players are in the 50K mixed game tournament. Funny enough, in that tournament, everyone's not world-class. Or if they are world-class, they're bad at game selection. One of the important skills of poker is game selection, and clearly in a tournament, everyone is not winning. I don't know anything about that field, but I would guess it's something like, I don't know, half the field or more is negative EV. Probably, probably about half the field is negative EV in that field, which means they're making bad decisions. They're not good poker players in terms of making money. That is always an interesting question. Like, what defines a good poker player? Is the person who wins the most money? Is the person who has the biggest edge in terms of big blinds? Is the person who can play the highest and not go broke? Like, what is the um, definition of a great poker player? And you get to pick. We're not taking notes on players, so adjusting to ranges is hard. Why are you not taking notes? JonathanLittlePoker.com slash notes. But no, I mean, if you see someone limping 15 hands in a row... Clearly, you should adjust, right? If you see someone opening from early position with a seven offsuit because you see the showdown, clearly you should adjust. 
I mean, you see things if you're paying attention, and even like one hand example is enough to let you realize, all right, I need to adjust here. Do you agree that I should chop if you get more than third place money? That is a, an, an irrelevant question because we do not know the situation. Um, let's see. There, I do have an article though, um, or it's a video now actually. It's let's not make a deal. Google Jonathan Little, let's not make a deal. And you will see my thoughts on chopping. Um, where can you get my cash game course? It is only available at Poker Coaching Premium, which will be available tomorrow. We're launching it tomorrow. With any luck, it'll go well. <laughs> you never know. Um, you can go get on the email list for that at pokercoaching.com slash premium. So check that out. Learn to play shorthanded. Learn to play shorthanded is very important. We discussed that in the Cash Game Masterclass, actually. Really, it's not all that different than full ring. The main difference is that um, you really just assume the first three people folded. So low jack seat is under the gun, six handed. That's it. So you're playing low jack, high jack, cut off button, small blind, big blind. Forget under the gun, under gun plus one, under gun plus two. And there you go. Does a seven day trial of access to premium? No. Um, how much does it cost? I don't think I'm supposed to spoil that. It's not a ton though. Have you ever considered selling pieces of myself on Stake Kings? I used to in the past, but it was a lot of work for no real benefit. Um, I mean, now I'm just giving away pieces. This World Series, I gave away 1% of all my action to someone. I also um, gave away 3% of my World Series main event to someone. And um, we bought in two veterans yesterday to the, to the Salute Your Warriors tournament. We also bought in some people to the $500 Colossus event, five people to that. We bought in three people to the, no, five people to the Big 50, three people to the Colossus. We spent, I don't know, something like $6,000 on um, buy-ins, just giving them away. So we're giving them away. I do sell action to high stakes tournaments every once in a while, but I have a close group of friends who I send an email and they send me money and we're done. I don't need to go through the hassle of selling 1% at a time and all that. It's just not worth it. Um, there is merit though in like a marketing play, like kind of like what Negrandu did, right? Where he basically sold some percentage at even money, which I think is the right way to do it if you're going to do it for a marketing play. And... It's a lot of fun. That said, it seems like it's been a big headache for him too. So um, it's it's tough. Can you get 1% of my World Series main event? If you won the raffle, you got it. We do a lot of raffles, by the way. If you all are not aware of this, I think this year we've given away something like $15,000 worth of tournament entries to all of you, just for fun. Uh, let's see. Can you upgrade your current poker coaching to poker coaching premium? Yes, you absolutely can. There are upgrade options. Uh, let's see. You cash two out of your three bracelet events. Great job. Good job. Good work. So far, I've had some pretty deep runs in bracelet events. Someone won a bracelet, credited Jonathan Little. Don't know if I'm supposed to out his name. Maybe I am. Whatever. Um, one of my students for a long time, who I personally knew, he took 12th place in the seniors event for like 40 buy-ins. Good job. Good work. Um, we've had some good successes so far. What do you think about super late registration? I don't like it. I like one entry, show up on time. Like the good old days. That said, I'm an old man. Um, these two trophies behind me, both of those were won in tournaments where I think you had two or four hours to register. And then you're done. One entry, that's it. It's a lot of power in being able to apply a lot of aggression early in tournaments. And you can't really do that quite as much with... Um, with, with re-entry events because people aren't so so afraid to call. It's very different when people fly across the country, play a tournament. They don't want to lose on the first in the first hour, so you can be quite aggressive. Um, but yeah, Anthony, it's important to realize that if you have good results and you don't charge much markup, you should be able to sell a lot of action very quickly. Like whenever I send out like this this World Series for the twenty five or for the fifteen K and ten K tournaments, I sold what, 40%, I think, and it sold out in like two minutes, you know, because it's not hard to sell if you're not trying to gouge people. The problem, and you have good results, right? The problem is a lot of people don't have good results and they try to gouge people. So instead of trying to gouge people and have no results, I have good results and I don't gouge people and 
You can sell out quickly. You have people buy your action, no problem. It's no headache. And just done. Nice and easy. I like it nice and easy. I don't want headaches. You're going to find that as you do, um, as you have more and more things going on, more irons in the fire, you don't want headaches. Have I been using the new online registration option? I have. It's great. They do charge you $3 for it, which is kind of silly. I don't know why they're doing that. But basically, I went to the Rio. I gave them a pile of cash. And now, I don't have to wait in line anymore. Think of the value. <laughs> but yes, I'm already registered for the uh, main event in the 5K. So I'm just going to show up, get my ticket, and go. Determining the quality of your opponents has been a topic you've wondered about. In your home game, you play with 50 players or so. A good number of them run deep in lower World Stakes World Series event. Is that a good qualifier for good players? Well, good a good player is someone who is better than you, in theory. Right? And if someone is better than you... Presumably they're good. But I mean, the idea of what is good, what is bad, what is a maniac, what's a nit, it's all relative, right? You can't think that someone's good, therefore blank, or someone's good, bad, therefore blank. You always want to classify what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let's see. Speaking of keeping things simple, Poker Coaching Premium Launch is simple. There is one price for everyone. Nothing fancy, no discounts. You have to understand, this is by far the most comprehensive thing we've ever put out. And we are selling it purely based on the premise that it is so much value that if you play one to no limit, or if you play $300 buy-in tournaments, you would be silly to not sign up because you're gonna get way more value than the cost. So we're making life easy to start with. Maybe we lose some signups, people who want to get a deal. Everybody wants to get a deal, it seems. But think about this, right? You're getting hundreds of hours of content and we're updating it on a regular basis, right? We're adding new classes every month. We're giving you webinars every month. And like in my mind, like, look, I signed up to all the poker training sites because I realized the value. Like even if I watch one video and pick up one thing, it's worth like some of the more expensive ones are $300 a month. It's worth $300 a month. And I'm happy to pay that, no problem. Mine's not gonna be $300 a month, it's gonna be cheaper because I realize, you know, everyone's not, everyone does not wanna spend that much money on uh, sites. But anyway, poker coaching is one of the highest return on investment things you can possibly do because you're essentially trading some amount of money for years and years of experience condensed down to exactly what you need. Now, most sites, the information's all sporadic, it's all spread out. At Poker Coaching Premium, it is very clearly laid out so you can find exactly what you need. And if you don't find what you need, we want you to send me an email. And then I will make a 30-minute class discussing exactly that topic. Can we talk about combating limpers? We already did that. We did that at the beginning. Let's see. Let's see, let's see. But yes, go to pokercoaching.com slash premium, get on the email list, and we'll email you tomorrow. What percentage of the field are winners long-term? I honestly don't know. Um, it's actually probably a lot. Probably a lot. More than, more than most people would think. Because, um, like, what is winning? If winning means you win $1 per year, probably a pretty good amount of people win more than a dollar a year. How can you create a range for a tripping, tricky limper who is a competent thinking player? What does it look like? Well... Like I said, one of the best players in the world, I know for a fact they're limping with stuff like aces, kings, queens, ace, king, and then depending on their position, hands that are at the bottom of their raising range. So like king eight suited, queen eight suited, jack eight suited, nine seven suited, basically hands that are not quite good enough to raise or are barely good enough to raise. And then they're limping with those hands looking to limp call with the majority of it. That way they're very, very well protected. Any link to co poker coaching premium? Pokercoaching.com slash premium. Go there. There's a link. Um, but anyway, that's what a good player's range will look like. Will there still be poker coaching not premium? Yes, you all have to understand. Poker coaching, when we first launched, we were putting out two quizzes per week and one homework webinar per month. Now, we're putting out five quizzes a week, if not more, and we still have the homework webinar, and we also have been having webinars by Alex Fitzgerald, Matt Affleck, and Evan Jarvis, that are just added on. They're just bonus, they're complimentary. And 
I always want to make sure we are over delivering. So whenever we promise something, for example, with Poker Coaching Premium, we have the you know hundreds of hours of classes, we have additional quizzes. We are guaranteeing additional stuff we are adding each month, but I can already tell you, we're adding more because I already know what I'm making. I'm making more than that already. And I always make a point to under-promise and over-deliver. And that way, well, to be fair, I'm not even under-promising. I'm promising a decent amount. But I think hard work and good content wins at the end of the day. And that's what we try to do. Do I have any PLO books or webinars? Nope. I am working on a book, though, with a world-class PLO player. Don't think I'm allowed to out it to say the names yet. But um, very popular vlogger. And there'll be a book for DMB Publishing coming out in the future. I'm in charge of sourcing good quality content for DMB Poker. We had Modern Poker Theory, which is like one of the best poker books ever written. Maybe not quite as good as Mastering. Mastering is a little bit more implementable, not going to lie. But Modern Poker Theory is amazing. That's coming out very soon. I helped get um, Dylan Lin's book. It's uh, Mastering Mixed Games. Is that what it's called? I think that's what it's called. Um, that's a fantastic book. It's not like the most advanced book, but it certainly is a very good um, introduction. And it'll get you to the medium stakes of various games, like all sorts of weird games. Badoogie and Ace to Five Single Draw and all sorts of stuff. Um, what else? We help source Mike Sexton's biography, Phil Helmuth's biography. My books, clearly. Anyway, my job to make friends and get good content. And we've done that for PLO. It's coming out probably next year sometime. Anthony, just go into your email. We're going to make life easy for you. Is Modern Poker Theory available in the UK? It's available worldwide. Aaron says he spent $500 on coaching and $100 on a training video package. You've won approximately $3,800 in small six tournaments since then. And realize you have that information for forever. Is Modern Poker Theory the GTO one? Yes. Was it tedious reading the book for the audiobook? It's tedious, but I don't mind it. I'm a grinder, right? I get in there, I grind, and I like grinding and working hard. Am I a coach from Pokar.com? No, I'm not a coach, but I'm a consultant. I give them information, often pertaining to live backing. I've done a ton of live backing. And um, they're in live backing as well now. Have I read anything about Andrew Brokos's book? I heard that it was a relatively basic introduction to game theory optimal play. But... Not a big fan of relatively basic introductions of things. I haven't read it yet, to be fair. Will Inner Circle still remain? It will remain for the time being, but nobody else can sign up to Inner Circle. It is capped. Um, all right. I have to go to my meeting now. Hope you've enjoyed this discussion on limpers and whatever else you all want to talk about. It seems like that's how it goes. If you have any ideas for topics for a little coffee, please let me know. What's my favorite book on tells? Can I have it back here? I don't. Reading Poker Tells by, what's his name? Zach Elwood. Also, in this big book here, Selling a No Limit Hold'em, we have a chapter on Tells by Zach Elwood. Let me see what it's called. It is called An Overview of Poker Tells. So check that out. You can find this at holdembook.com. I actually did two webinars with um, Zach Elwood where we go through all sorts of tells. So check it out, holdenbook.com or excelling at no limit, holden.com, whatever you want. Had to take a note. Need to get those on Poker Coaching Premium for all the premium members. Um, all right, so that's it. Have a great day. Is there a link to Modern Poker Theory? Go to dandbpoker.com. dandbpoker.com and it should be there somewhere. There's also a magazine. By the way, you might, all may not know this. I am the editor of the DNB Poker Magazine. Every week we put out one or two articles, um, some by myself, some by other authors. Some of them are book excerpts of new books that are coming out. And um, again, another free resource I make for all of you. I, I convinced them to make a magazine. I said, I'll do the work. We did the work. Here we are. And now we've been making it for, I don't know, six months now. So do the math. What's six times eight? 48 articles there. Just all there for you, hanging out. dbpoker.com slash magazine is the magazine. All right, that's going to be it for today. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Thank you very much for being here. Again, go sign up, pokercoaching.com slash premium to get to be the first ones into Poker Coaching Premium. And, um, you know, if you want to sign up to Poker Coaching for free, pokercoaching.com. 
Also, if you already are a Poker Coaching member, in a, in a day or two, there's going to be a new classes link in your dashboard. You can click there and you will see all the classes available and some of them will be there for you. They're just included. Again, more value for the Poker Coaching members. Again, always over deliver. That's what we do. That's it. Good luck in your games. Have fun. I will see you again on Friday.